Hello and welcome to Northeast Animal Rights, uh, latest in the series of Spotlight, Saturday Spotlight interviews. Today we are absolutely delighted to have Captain Paul Watson, who was the founder of Sea Shepherd with us today. Um, so thank you very much and welcome and thank you for giving up, up, giving up, up your precious time today to talk to us. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. Without further ado, if that's okay with you, we'll go straight into the questions. Um, obviously, some of the questions are quite long, so feel free to just sort of talk around the questions as you, as you see fit. So first of all, obviously, we, we are, we're interested in your vegan journey. So can you tell us about your vegan journey yourself, please? Well, I started with the ships as ve they were vegetarian vessels in uh, 1979 when we got our first ship. And, and uh, that was a time when nobody even knew what a vegan was, mm -hmm. really. <laughs> Uh, so in 1999, we switched to make the ships 100% um, vegan, which they are to this day, two decades later. It doesn't mean you have to be vegan to join the crew, but you have to be vegan while you're on the crew because you really don't have any other choice. But the reason we did that is that we feel that uh, it would be hypocritical for us not to. When you consider that we're out there protecting marine wildlife. And a good 35% uh, of all of the fish that's taken from the sea is actually fed to pigs and chickens and domestic salmon. So even when you're eating a hamburger, you're eating, you know, you're eating a fish. Yeah. And uh, we live in a world where chickens now on factory farms are actually eating more fish than all the world's puffins and albatrosses put together. So it's a complete world uh, out of balance. So for Sea Shepherd, it's really a conservation issue. But at the same time, you know, we have a lot of people in the animal rights movement that are involved as crew members and supportive and everything. But really, it uh, really illustrates that there's a, a relationship between animal rights and conservation, both land and marine conservation. So after, I mean, you've, you've witnessed some horrendous things over, over, the, over the years. So after you've witnessed all of this, what, what makes you get back out there and, and want to do it all again? And, and what gives you hope? Well, I don't really worry about that. You know, back in 1973, I was a, a volunteer medic for the American Indian Movement during the occupation of Wounded Knee in South Dakota. And uh, we were surrounded by 3,000 federal agents who were shooting at us. They killed two and wounded 46. And I went to the leader of the American Indian Movement, Russell Means, and I said, look, the odds against us are overwhelming. Uh, overwhelming. We have no hope of winning. So why are we continuing to, why do we continue to be here? And he told me something that would stay with me for the rest of my life. He said, look, we're not concerned about the odds against us. And we're not concerned about winning or losing. We're here because it's the right place to be, the right thing to do, and the right time to do it. Don't worry about the future. Focus on the present. What you do in the present will define what the future will be. And that's what we do with Sea Shepherd. We're not concerned about the future because that's out of our control. What we can control is the present. And, uh, and that's where we, we focus our attentions and things evolve as, as that is. So I think that the future, which is now, which went in the past, that future is much better for what we've done in the present back in 1980, 1990, 2000, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, recently you were talking about the massive subsidies that uh, the fishing industries get, uh, particularly Japan. And we've got a similar um, issue in the UK with dairy bailouts, particularly through lockdown. We were seeing lots of um, protests against um, against the, uh, the dairy bailouts. And we know that these industries would not survive without, without the, uh, the, uh, the bailouts and also the subsidies they get just generally. Um, so what do you think is about successive governments? I mean, these are all different political parties as well, Democrats, Republicans, and we've got obviously Conservatives, Labour, Lib Dems here. So why do you think they're failing to address this issue? Well, the funny thing about capitalism is that uh, it's okay until, but when the industries can't survive on their own, then they prop them up, which is a form of corporate communism uh, mm -hmm. in, in a way. A lot of these industries simply couldn't survive. The fishing industry could not survive without subsidies. Yeah. About 76 billion dollars a year uh, that, that props up industrialized fishing and uh, so that's the real problem but there the, even more so is that there's two groups that I think are fishermen and farmers yeah. who politicians live in abject fear of they are totally terrified of those two two groups because uh, they feel that they hold a lot of political power in fact I even coined a word for uh, uh, politicians fear of fishermen. I call it homofeshophobia. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they tend to get what they want. And if they don't get what they want, they hold a temper tantrum and pour thousands of gallons of milk onto the steps of a parliament or or they throw rotten fish onto the streets. I mean, they, they act like uh, petulant children in, yeah. in, in that respect. But um, they're, they're up against um, a tide which they can't stop. Mm -hmm. And 
animal rights, veganism, conservation, these are growing movements. I don't think there's a movement in human history that's been faster growing than, than the vegan movement. It's, um, I think, in just uh, in Europe, the US alone, it's uh, increased by 600% over the last 10 years. And uh, so we're attracting more and more people. And that's led to new industries, uh, plant-based meat industries. Um, and when you take a look at the, uh, the profits of com companies like uh, Beyond Meat, and for example, like that, you, you see that, that there's a trend there. And that's where the future is going. Mm -hmm. I also take heart in the fact that if you look at any science fiction films, I know Star Trek or whatever, the future is vegan. All, <laughs> all the guys are all vegans. So we, we intuitively know that that's where it's going. The world has no place for 8 billion, soon to be 10 billion, soon to be 12 billion meat eating, fish eating primates. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to find a way to coexist with the natural world. And we're not going to do that by... Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, killing 65 billion animals a year on land and trillions of fish every year. It's undermining the ecosystems and it's diminishing uh, biodiversity and it's diminishing interdependence. Yeah, just picking up on two points there. I mean, one is a sort of like a minor thing. My husband and myself watched a, um, a program on Netflix called Travelers. It was a series about um, travelers kind of going backwards and forwards. And they were they were all vegan. They were actually in the, in the future, 100 years in the future, and everyone was vegan. And they were coming back like sort of like di with disbelief, looking at people still eating meat <laughs> in this day and age. So you're right, the future is vegan. <laughs> That's so the difference with that series, though, is that I don't think that that was a choice of theirs at the time, yeah. but it really illustrates where the future will go. Yeah. If, mm -hmm. if, we, if we don't, it will collapse. That yeah. collapse will lead to a world where yeah. you won't have any choice but yeah. to eat whatever. I think they were living actually on yeast and algae. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, and also uh, another point you, you mentioned about the um, the political party sort of like being terrified of farmers and fishermen kind of like doing this big display or like petulant display. But why do you think they're frightened of them? I mean, a lot of these, um, you know, the, the farmers, they're, they're not all wealthy landowners. Some of them are quite f sort of small, small entities. So why do you think that um, the governments are frightened to take them on? I think that uh, in many cases are just afraid of, of them because there's a lot of people involved in those industries. I remember when we were in Ecuador and uh, the government had put a ban on the uh, taking of sea cucumbers and the yeah. fishermen just crazy. We went on a riot and they occupied the national park. They threatened right. to kill tortoises. And we got involved with that issue. And uh, the government backed down. They gave them everything they wanted. And I, and I said to them at the time, I said, why are you doing this? I mean, we're winning this. We're actually going to be able to, to, to drive them out of the park and we're going to win this. And, and their, their answer was that they were just concerned about uh, the political power yeah. that, uh, that, these industry, that these industries had. And also to keep in mind that, uh, you know, fishing and fishermen and farmers are entrenched in uh, anthropocentric culture, the Bible mm -hmm. and things like this are almost mm -hmm. considered sacred in a way. Jesus was a fisherman, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so there's always a, also that hesitation to interfere with something which they feel is part of their, of, of their value system. Yeah, yeah. So we know that animal agriculture is one of the biggest pollutants on our planet. So what is the biggest pollutant to the oceans? And what, what do you think of the UK government's, uh, what we think was a bit of a knee-jerk knee reaction a couple of years ago to ban items like plastic straws and the limited success with charging for carrier bags. Um, but they're still not looking at things like, you know, like single-use plastics, which, which end up in our waterways. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot, a lot of the time we were saying to people, never mind, you know, not using plastic straws, just stop eating the fish in the first place. So, um, so, so what do you think, what, what's the biggest pollutant for, for, um, for, the, for the oceans? And what do you think of the, the government's reactions to kind of like, it's almost like a small, small scale reaction that they've had? Well, the meat industry is the single greatest contributor to dead zones in the ocean, the single yeah. greatest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, more yeah. so than transportation industry. It's the single greatest contributor to groundwater pollution. And uh, when you add to that the destruction caused by the fishing industry, which mm -hmm. diminishing the species, and also uh, plastic straws, uh, you know, that's a serious thing. About a billion plastic straws go into the ocean every year, but it's less than uh, one half of 1% of the mm -hmm. plastic that goes into the ocean. The greatest contributor to plastic pollution and marine debris is the fishing industry. Mm -hmm. And so it always has been uh, a mystery to me why everybody makes a big deal about the plastic straws, but at the same time ignores the nets mm -hmm. and the fishing gear that, that's out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you really look at some of the big NGOs, a lot of their... Um, you know, the, uh, the anti-plastic ones. Uh, a lot of their uh, their contributions come from certain industries. 
and including uh, the fishing industry. Mm -hmm. Now, the fishing industry has got a massive PR machine. They mm -hmm. would like you to, to think that the fish that you buy in a restaurant or in the store, or fish and chips or whatever, they would like you to think that that was, that, that, that was brought to you by a, a small group of hardworking individuals out there yeah. on their small little boats yeah. catching the, with the pulling in their nets by hand. Mm -hmm. But the reality is super trawlers and $100 million ships uh, long uh, bottom draggers, long liners, 100 mile long liners, uh, 100 mile long gill nets, mm -hmm. industrial corporate fishing. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they say, well, you know, the poor fishermen, who are the poor fishermen? Yeah. They're the artisanal fishermen of Africa and India mm -hmm. and places like that who are actually being uh, deprived mm -hmm. of fish by the corporate industrial fishing operations. Mm -hmm. And nobody thinks about them at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so we live in a world where you pull a fish out of the southern ocean off the coast of Antarctica, the uh, Antarctic toothfish, mm -hmm. and then you fly it around the world to uh, London and Paris yeah. and New York, and you market mm -hmm. it as filet and sea bass. It's not yeah. for children, it's not a bass. Mm -hmm. But, you know, really, that's so, they even have the audacity to call that a sustainable fishery. Yeah. You know, you can't pull a fish out of the water and send it halfway around the world at enormous carbon costs and everything and call that sustainable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so, uh, yeah. We have um, some great uh, sea shepherd groups down here in the northeast, um, and you know, I've, 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 I am in touch with some of their members, and uh, and they say that one of the things they're constantly dragging up when they do the beach cleans is the nets, the, the fishing nets. Um, and there's also a company called um, North Sea Reject, and they recycle the, the fishing nets and make them into bracelets and jewelry. Uh, which is great, but um, it's just such a shame that the, you know, that the, I mean, when you see the photographs of what they're bringing up, it's just horrendous, the stuff that they're bringing on, uh, on the shore um, from the rocks and everything, you know, it's just so, so damaging. And not only to obviously the deeper, sort of like the animals in the deeper oceans, but the animals which live around the, the rocks and in the shores as well. Yeah. Well, 1985, when I first began to talk about uh, plastic pollution, especially microplastics, mm -hmm. uh, I attended a lecture uh, on this uh, by Charles Moore, who had mm -hmm. set up uh, an organization to address this, and nobody really gave it credence. I think Greenpeace actually attacked me for getting involved in such a trivial issue as plastic mm -hmm. pollution. Uh, but it, we're now seeing just how horrendous a yeah. uh, problem it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and it comes from so many sources, uh, fishing mm -hmm. debris, not plastic bottles, plastic straws, but the very fact that your automobile tires uh, release microplastics every time they go down the road and that ends up getting washed into the ocean. That's a large uh, amount of microplastics. Mm -hmm. uh, the plastic breaks down and uh, sun and salt and that's where it's really dangerous. The plastic bottle floating up on the beach is unsightly, yeah. but the microplastic that's yeah. in the ocean, that's what's eaten by the fish, that's what's yeah. being consumed by plankton, that's mm -hmm. what gets into the bodies of marine mammals and whales and that gets into the bodies of human beings also. Yeah. So uh, it is a major, major problem. Yeah. Uh, the pollution in the ocean is a far ranging spectrum of problems. It's plastic, it's chemicals, it's radiation. Fukushima mm -hmm. is a good example. Uh, it's also uh, noise pollution from ships and uh, nuclear uh, uh, or weapons and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, there's also acidification, which is coming from warming waters. And that there's so many factors contributing to the diminishment of biodiversity in the ocean. So mm -hmm. it's hard to say that one is more important than the other. It's a, it's a cumulative effect yeah. of all of those problems. Um, I would like to talk about, I mean, obviously, um, the, the big film out at the moment, the big documentary at the moment is Sea Spiracy. Um, and I know you obviously contributed to, to that as well. Um, and um, one, of, um, one of the the problems which has been highlighted by sea spiracy is the extent of, of sort of extent of the damage which commercial fishing does to the oceans, the bottom trawling. Um, but we know obviously there's quite a lot of jobs um, relying on this industry. And as, as animal rights activists dealing with, we kind of like deal with more like land animals. And we get told quite a lot that we are dealing, you know, we're taking away people's jobs. So what would be your response to those uh, people who are saying that, you know, by shutting down commercial fishing and stopping bottom trawling that you're, you're doing the same thing and you're, you're taking away jobs? Well, by uh, in, in 30, 40 years, there won't be any jobs because of what they're doing right now. So nobody will have that job. You know, I, I asked a fisherman in Alaska one time, I said, uh, if nothing, for nothing else, protect the fishery for the benefit of your children. Yeah. Maybe they will be involved in it in the future. And his answer really illustrated to me the, the real underlying problem. He mm -hmm. said to me, you know, in five years, uh, my mortgage is paid after that. I couldn't give a damn. Why does somebody like that have children? Well, it's yeah. sort of what you do. You don't really give it any thought as to why. Yeah. And 
everybody goes mindlessly, thoughtlessly through their life, not looking at the uh, consequences of, uh, of their actions. Mm -hmm. uh, the Iroquois, uh, they have a saying is make no decision in your life until you take into account the impact or the consequences of that decision on all future generations. Mm -hmm. We certainly don't live that way. It's all short term investment uh, mm -hmm. for, for, for short term uh, gain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Seaspiracy uh, has been great. Uh, mainly because of the medium, which is Netflix has reached millions of people. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it's all right to make documentaries, which we make all the time, but if they don't reach anybody, they're not useless. Yeah. And what the secret to making a good uh, documentary film is to really tell a story and mm -hmm. see Spiracy as a story of Ali and Lucy uh, Debris. Mm -hmm. It's their personal story. And yeah. people can relate to that. It's like Rob Stewart, Sharkwater, or yeah. Diane Foster, Gorillas in the Mist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the Earl with the Mission Blue. These are stories that people mm -hmm. can relate and mm -hmm. uh, an excellent vehicle for getting your, your message across. Mm -hmm. I know one of the criticisms of Sea Spiracies is uh, that they said they debunked the, um, the prediction that 2048 that uh, <laughs> collapse. And so does it really matter if it's 2048 or 2078? Yeah. Matter. Personally, I think it's 2030, but uh, yeah. they're just nit nitpicking when it comes yeah. to that. Yeah, I think. Um, do, do you think that sea spiracy is kind of like it's um, the, the timing of it was uh, what was is perfect almost because um, we have this big. I mean, obviously everybody's been in lockdown, so they're much more likely to watch things. Um, they're much they're kind of on social media much more now, so people's awareness of, of things like this they've, they've got much more time to to, to watch things. Um, and maybe five years ago, the time for sea spiracy maybe wasn't right. Um, I'm kind of thinking, you know, that this is game changers and say are the other the, the most two recent ones which have gone sort of absolutely massive, you know, across the world. Um, and maybe some of the, I mean Dominion as well, but it seems to be sort of gaining some momentum and maybe this is the right time for say spiracy. Maybe like a few years ago it wouldn't have been received in the way it, it was to, if, today. What do you think? Less possible, but I also believe that these films build on one another. You know, you had Earthlings mm -hmm. and then you had you had Sharkwater and you had Racing Extinction, uh, yeah. you had uh, uh, all of these various films, and each of them gets more uh, more influential. I mean, The Cove, for instance, won the Academy Award, and yeah. this year, the, My Octopus Teacher won the Academy yeah. Award for Best Documentary. Yeah. So I think that there's a growing awareness, uh, independent of everything else, there's just this growing awareness of that. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly a need for uh, future films uh, to explore that. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. the conspiracy, you got 90 minutes to talk about a problem, which is yeah. global. Mm -hmm. and, uh, when people say, well, it didn't cover this, it didn't cover that. Of course it didn't. It was just simply not enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. that. But mm -hmm. uh, certainly leaves it open for further uh, exploration in, you know, documentaries and various other forms yeah. of media. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I mean, I watched it as soon as it came out and it was just so compelling. Um, but, 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 all, but I think there's not much, um, I think what's good about it is there's not much stuff which is graphic in it, um, apart from obviously towards um, sort of like maybe three quarters of the way through when they're talking about the Grind, Grind uh, rap, the, um, the um, event which happens in, in the Faroe Islands. One of our, um, you know, one of my colleagues, fellow, fellow animal rights activist, Laura, she's in Sea Shepherd and she's actually been to the Faroe Islands to investigate this. Um, and I was surprised to hear from her. I mean, I thought this was an annual event. And she says it happens actually more frequently than that. And people are kind of like, the pattern off is a cultural event. Um, you know, kind of like they use the meat and everything, but actually there's an awful lot of waste. Um, so, so how do you think they cover it up so well? And, and, you know, and how do they continue to fool people that this is a cultural event and that they have the right to, to do this? Actually, as we speak, uh, Grind is happening in the Faroes right now and they're driving the pod uh, towards uh, the beach at this very moment. And um, the Faroese have even gone to the uh, point where they're asking UNESCO to declare the Grind as a cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. Well, that'd be all well and good as a cultural heritage if they went out with their rowboats and, uh, and didn't yeah. use upboard motors and all this motorized equipment and everything. Mm -hmm. But the reason it continues to go on is the uh, absolute incredible stubbornness of the people of the Faroe Islands who insist that they have a right to do this and the backing of the European Union and the Danish government uh, in supporting them in that. The Grind is illegal under the laws of the European Union. And uh, although the Faroes say that they're not part of the European Union, they receive subsidies from Denmark, which yeah. is part of the European Union. Mm -hmm. And about 80% of the Faroese hold the uh, EU passports, the Danish passports. Mm -hmm. so therefore, they should be subjected to the law. Yeah. 
Um, we've been fighting the uh, the Grind in uh, the Faroe Islands since 1981 when we, we first went there. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that, uh, you know, you don't win any of these things overnight. It's You mm -hmm. just have to be relentless and persistent. We fought the Canadian seal hunt uh, from... Mm -hmm. 1974 until finally in 2008, the European Union banned seal pelts and the market was uh, undermined. Um, they still kill seals, but uh, far fewer than they would have if the market was still there. So we accomplished everything we could in that respect. The quota has been set at a ridiculous 450,000 yeah. seals, but uh, they've never killed more than 40,000 of that because mm -hmm. there's simply no market. And it only exists because of massive subsidies from the Canadian yeah. government. All whaling and sealing operations in the world today are, are survived because of subsidies, mm -hmm. subsidies from the governments, Norway, Japan, Canada. Yeah. So obviously with the grins that have, um, I mean, we, we, you know, pretty horrified because we see children taking part in this event as well. Um, and, and this murderous event is absolutely horrendous. So what do you think it, it says about a nation that allows the children who, you know, we see as the most vulnerable, um, vulnerable stage of their lives when they're learning sort of about, about new, new things. Um, when they take part in the grind or fox hunting, obviously we had over here and we still have because it still goes on. Um, but we're still exposing them to things um, which will change how they look at things, you know, and um, I mean, is it sort of some sort of abuse? I mean, you know, what do you think it says about nations who, who allow that to happen? Well, the Faroese got very upset with me a few years ago when I described the Grind as a form of uh, child abuse. Mm -hmm. Not only are they exposing children to the atrocities, but they're also feeding them meat, which is toxic. It's full yeah. of mercury. And to knowingly feed poison to your children is a form of, of uh, child abuse. Uh, and the, the other thing about the Grind is it's incredible wasteful. The number of whales that they take, if you yeah. take into account, they're only allowed to have 220 grams a month of that whale meat, and a good 40% of the Paris don't even eat it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an incredible amount of waste. And usually what they do is after there's a new Grind, they just simply empty their freezers, put in the new meat, and toss the, the old meat. Mm -hmm. And, but they also dump like literally hundreds of bodies into the sea. And we've documented those graveyards under the ground where they weigh down the bodies and, and, and send them to the bottom. We've dove down there and we, we, we filmed that. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, there's nothing uh, cultural uh, mm -hmm. about it. It's, uh, they do it because they enjoy the killing. It's yeah. a it's blood sport. It's just mm -hmm. like the fox hunt. It's just like it's just yeah. like uh, bullfighting. It's it's a blood mm -hmm. sport, mm -hmm. and you know they all get drunk and they go running down there. And um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I guess there's not a lot to do uh, otherwise in the Faroe Islands other than go out and kill something. You know, yeah. I remember one Canadian sealer one time told me he says, "Well, you know, the real reason we like to go sealing is the chance to get out of the house, get away from the wife, and go and kill something." Mm -hmm. You know that that was what they said. It, it is it's, a, it's like a typical sort of primitive um almost like a primitive need in people to do that to kind of um you know the fox hunters i mean the again they kind of say it's a cultural thing and then they'll, then they'll dress it up as and um, you know they're trying to keep uh, vermin down um but it's just i mean i say it's child abuse the same as you do because it is child abuse i can't see that it's anything other than if you're gonna you know sort of introduce a child who is who in a normal situation would not go out and hurt an animal. If you give them a rabbit or, you know, or a cat or another animal, they would not, their natural instinct is not to hurt that animal. And you are telling them that it's okay to do that. And that to me is seriously screwed up. That is, that is child abuse. Um, so you talked about Iceland. I mean, I know Iceland obviously had a ban on, on whaling. Um, and um, so, so why did they restart the whaling? Well, they restarted and then they stopped again. There hasn't been any whales killed in Iceland in the last three years. So right. uh, I think that's pretty much ended. You know, we've accomplished a lot since 1974. Mm. I would say 95% of whaling operations since that mm. time are now, now ended. Mm. When we began, Iceland and Chile, Spain and Korea and South Africa were all whaling nations. They're no longer whaling nations. Mm. Uh, and as of two years ago, all whaling has been uh, restricted to the territorial waters of mm. Norway. Denmark mm -hmm. and uh, Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no pelagic whaling anymore. Mm -hmm. No whales being killed in international waters. So we've achieved a lot. I said in my, uh, you know, many years ago, I said the one thing I would love to achieve in my lifetime is the complete eradication of the perversion of whaling. Mm -hmm. And I think we're about 95% on that. Now, when people say, well, why don't you go to uh, Japan right now? Well, the reason we're not going to Japan is because the Japanese government would love us to go to Japan. 
they need, they would love us to increase that fervor, that nationalistic fervor, and uh, that'll be a tool they can use to keep it going. But we realize that economically, that the uh, whaling in Japan, it'll be gone in five or six years. It's it's it's, it's unsustainable, mm -hmm. and the government's going to tire of the huge subsidies that it gives to it. Uh, but if we go in there, of course, then everybody will get all excited and they'll continue to increase the subsidies and the killing will mm -hmm. continue. So sometimes when you're doing this work, you have to know when to step back yeah. and allow these, uh, these industries to die a, a natural death. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, Iceland was, uh, we, we were there in Iceland three years ago. We were there for every year documenting. We were exposing what they were doing. Mm -hmm. We are sending vessels. And as of, you know, for the last three years, no whales have been killed. And we're watching that situation closely, but I feel confident that Iceland is now no longer that. But also keep in mind, in 1977, we were fighting uh, whaling in Australia, and Australia was a whaling nation. Today, it is one of the strongest anti-whaling nations. Mm -hmm. So things can be changed around. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was watching a, um, a recent interview you did with, uh, with Jackie Norman from Vegan FTU. Um, and, and within it, you said that um, obviously you didn't have social media when you first started. Um, so, um, I mean, obviously it's you're kind of like all, all over and all social media and, you, um, and, and your message gets out quite quite a lot of people. Um, but how hard was it to get your message out? And you're sort of, I mean, I know obviously they couldn't watch what you were doing. So that was one good thing. Um, but how hard was it to get your message out when, when there was no social media around? Well, actually, it was a lot easier in one respect is that you only had like three networks in the United States and three networks in the UK. And, you know, the other was it uh, BBC, uh, Yorkshire TV, and was it ITV, I believe? Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, when you got your story out, you knew that one or more of those networks is going to cover it. And that's what people watched. Mm -hmm. But uh, now, of course, uh, it has sprouted all around the planet with uh, like the tentacles of media are everywhere. <laughs> Uh, so in a way that it, it makes it easier, but at the same time, it was, e it was easier to get the message across back then, but mm -hmm. I think we can reach a lot more people now through, uh, through this various media. Mm -hmm. Back then we, uh, Bob Hunter actually described what we were doing as, uh, he called it, uh, dropping mind bombs, which, uh, mm -hmm. today would be called going viral. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when we got our footage of them firing a harpoon over our head and we put it on Walter Cronkite's CBS News in the United States. That got incredible attention. That was called dropping a mind bomb. Yeah. So we, we've talked about, I mean, I mentioned at the beginning about the activism I'm involved in and it tends to be more, more land animal based, although we are doing um, sort of some fish themed um, outreach in the next few weeks. Do you think that animal rights activism is too focused on land animals and we don't give enough attention to say animals? Uh, because what um, because you know given we're so dependent on the oceans do you think that, that we don't get the balance right well i think that uh, the strength of an ecosystem is dependent upon diversity therefore the strength of any movement has to be in diversity mm -hmm. and i think when people like empty in a particular cause say the fox hunt or something like that uh that's fine if they're putting their energies towards that one thing and if they mm -hmm. can change that one thing that makes a considerable difference mm -hmm. you can't do it all you know, I really, you know, I used to, I was involved with uh, doing campaigns to protect elephants in East Africa, wolves, wolves and caribou in the in yeah. Yukon territories of Canada and Alaska. Mm -hmm. And I finally came to, uh, you know, I can't do all this. I have to mm -hmm. focus. And, uh, so that's why I focused on marine wildlife, which is still pretty big. Yeah. But uh, mm -hmm. I think that uh, we have to look at what can each of us do mm -hmm. and what we have to find, what are we passionate about? And then once you find out what you're passionate about, mm -hmm. um, you know, focus your skills and your abilities in that direction and harness your passion to mm. the virtues of courage and um, imagination. And that's when mm. you can make a difference. One of the things that we, we try to do with Sea Shepherd is to instill in our volunteers that each and every one of them can make a difference. Yeah. You know, back in 1981, I get a call from a guy in uh, uh, David McCall, a guy in uh, Glasgow, and he says, uh, they're killing seals here up in the Orkney Islands. What are you going to do about it? And I said, I don't know. I'm on the other side of the planet. My question to you is, what are you going to do about it? And he said, well, what can I do? I said, well, I'll use your imagination. We got together. He set up a Sea Shepherd group. And uh, he went up to the Orkney Islands, and he and his volunteers literally walked up to the uh, uh, sealers and pulled the rifles out of their hands and threw them into the ocean. And, and they all got arrested. And there was a big trial, a lot of publicity, and so much publicity that we actually raised enough money to buy that island, which is now a seal sanctuary. Because one guy said, what can I do? Uh, one of my crew members, an 18-year-old named Alex Pacheco, 
1979 on the campaign to go after the pirate whaler Sierra, he came to me and he said, you know, they're, they're, they're abusing these animals, torturing these animals in laboratories. We've got to do something about it. And I said, well, Alex, you know, this is Sea Shepherd. We're not about to get involved in that. But if this is something that you're passionate about, then you do something about it. Mm -hmm. So he went back uh, and got a job in the, one of the labs in Maryland, in the U.S., and uh, mm -hmm. He documented everything that was happening there for a year. They brought it to the media, to the Washington Post, to the TV, and exposed it and mm -hmm. shut the place down. Mm -hmm. And then on that uh, victory, he uh, established an organization called the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, or PETA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these things are, are, are actually, you know, invented or got off the ground by passionate individuals. Mm -hmm. One of my uh, captains, uh, you know, she was concerned about refugees uh, in North mm -hmm. Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what is she doing today? She got the artist Banksy to buy her a boat and she's off there at the north coast of Africa res rescuing mm -hmm. refugees. That's her passion. And therefore mm -hmm. she, uh, she, she, she's doing what she wanted to do. You can never let anybody tell you you can't do it. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, that part. Look what Greta Thunberg has done as a 16 year old girl, and mm -hmm. you know, just talking to world leaders and you know, mm -hmm. reaching millions of young people uh, through mm -hmm. with her message. You know? mm -hmm. It's amazing what uh, an individual can, can accomplish. Yeah. We often get told one, one person won't, can't make a difference, and we see, well, actually, very simply, if you stop eating animals, you've saved 300 animals in, a, in one year and you will make a difference to each of those animals. So one person can make a difference. But like you said, you've given some really good examples there of people who go on to um, not just by being vegan, by continuing to, to look at what they're passionate about and, and, and driving something forward. Um, so when, you, um, when you're about to stage an intervention, um, how do you feel? You know, How do you feel just before it? And how do you look after yourself? Um, and how do you also, because I know anybody in our sort of like line of work, um, you, you know, we do obviously get a lot of, uh, of a lot of trolling, a lot of negativity, a lot of abuse. Um, so how do you deal with that? And how do you look after yourself, your own mental health? And how do you kind of cope, um, you know, just before you're going to do an, an, an intervention? Not really I'm not really concerned about any negativity or criticisms. I don't mm -hmm. do this for people. I don't do it to, you know, yeah. back in 1986, we sank half of Iceland's whaling fleet, destroyed their whale processing plant, shut them down for 17 years. Mm -hmm. And a former colleague from Greenpeace came to me. He says, you know, what you did in Iceland was reprehensible, unforgivable, and you're an embarrassment to the movement. And I said, so? And he <laughs> said, well, I think you should, don't you care what people think about you? I said, no, not really. Uh, didn't sink those ships for you or Greenpeace or anybody else. We sank them for the whales, John. Uh, find me a whale that disagreed with uh, what yeah. we did. And I promise you, we won't do it again. Uh, so, you know, I, I, that was just kind of, you know, I think that my job as a marine conservationist doing anti-poaching, my job is to uh, basically to piss people off, you know, mm -hmm. to rock the boat yeah. and to be controversial and to make people think. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if, you, if, you, if you're concerned about what people think of you, you know, you're not going to make any yeah. uh, headway at all. Yeah. Um, the whole point, of, I mean, like one person can make a difference because of David Wingate, one guy in Bermuda, the Bermuda storm petrel, a little bird did not go extinct. Because of Diane Fossey, we have mountain gorillas in Rwanda. This is an example of how one person can make a difference. I think if you can dedicate your life to the preservation of a, of a species and make sure it doesn't go extinct, that's an incredibly uh, noble achievement. Yeah. So just going back to um, the whaling part a little bit. Um, so what do you think? What do you think is about specific countries like Japan, Norway, and Iceland? I mean, you're seeing obviously Iceland, it'll, it'll fade away. Uh, what do you think is about them that that, that they can they can whale without retribution? Um, aren't they in, in, interested in what their international reputation is, or are they actually just reveling in it? Like you said, with Japan, are they reveling in the fact that it brings them lots of sort of like almost cultural kudos? Well, with Japan, it's definitely a case of cultural nationalism. Yeah. Uh, and they're so hypocritical about it, you know. They they, um, they said that uh, you know, they 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 regard themselves as an indigenous hunt. You know, we support indigenous rights. That's why they were supporting um, Native Americans. You know, in their quest to try and re resume whaling. So we report we we support indigenous rights to go whaling. And yet, the Ainu people of Japan, the original people of Japan, are denied their indigenous rights. They were actually whalers, but they're not allowed to do it. So it's only the Japanese uh, who can do it in certain in certain communities. You know, Japan was not traditionally a whaling nation. Mm -hmm. uh, 
whaling, commercial whaling began in Japan in 1911 when Norway set up a whaling uh, station in mm -hmm. southern Japan. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it wasn't until 1945 that General Douglas MacArthur outfitted the whaling ships to go down to Antarctica. The Antarctic mm -hmm. Japanese whaling ships were the product of, uh, of the United States of organizing that and getting it off the ground mm -hmm. as a way to provide cheap protein to the Japanese and after the post-war uh, mm -hmm. you know, events. Uh, so, you know, I always say to them, if, if you think that whaling in Antarctica is part of your cultural heritage, mm -hmm. then occupation by United States military forces should be part of your heritage also because yeah. they're part of it. Mm -hmm. The killing of the dolphins in Tai Chi, that didn't even begin until the 60s. And it's not motivated by the desire to eat dolphins. It's motivated mm -hmm. by the desire to make a lot of money by capturing dolphins for yeah. dolphin. So one dolphin's worth about $200,000. Yeah. So uh, these, yeah. a lot of these things, which are called cultural or just convenience, it's like mm -hmm. the, the word sustainable. It's just a word. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. But if you put sustainable on your, on your products and if people say, oh, it's sustainable. We're going to yeah. buy that. Mm -hmm. There's no yeah. sustainable commercial. No. There's, you know, there's really no sustainable anything, you know, when yeah. you consider the populations and the abuse of, uh, of the ecosystems that we're living in. So what about Norway then? Because we've mentioned, you know, um, Japan and Iceland quite a lot, but what about Norway? Because I can't see how they can, I mean, they certainly don't have a cultural heritage heritage with, with whaling as far as I know. So it's, it's, it's again, it's a more recent thing with them. Yeah, well, whaling will die in Norway when it dies in Japan, because Japan is the major buyer of Norwegian right. whale meat. Mm -hmm. And of course, a lot of the whales that were killed in Norway are, still are, mm -hmm. are fed to uh, fur-bearing animals mm -hmm. and... Uh, and that is part of the it's part of the fishing industry there. And we certainly have fought in Norway in the past. Uh, we sunk a number of their their boats over the years. Uh, and we don't sink the whaling boats uh, in order to stop them because that's not going to stop them. But what it did achieve was uh, to um, dramatically uh, increase their insurance costs on all of their ships, and it's been very costly for them. They have to get war insurance on their on their vessels after targeted them. So it was really a financial blow that we were able to achieve with our attacks mm -hmm. on Norwegian uh, on Norwegian whaling. Mm -hmm. But Norway and Iceland were in violation of the International Whaling Commission's uh, regulations. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we always said that Sea Shepherd operates within the boundaries of the law. Mm -hmm. We're not taking, we're not judge and jury. The International Whaling Commission was judge and jury. We were just carrying out the uh, execution mm -hmm. of the law. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what's next for you then, and what's what's next for Sea Shepherd? Well, we just secured a new ship, uh, the Sea Eagle, which is now yeah. patrolling in the Mediterranean along with our other vessel, the Conrad, and their job is to confiscate uh, fish aggregating devices and marine debris and look out for poachers. Mm -hmm. uh, we're patrolling for, uh, against poachers in West Africa, and the last week we've arrested six uh, poaching vessels in the waters of Sierra Leone, mm -hmm. and over the last Half, we've arrested 65 poaching vessels in the waters of West Africa. Mm -hmm. Our vessel, Sam Simon, uh, has just completed his campaign in the Bay of Biscay to uh, go after the French trawling fleet, which is killing mm -hmm. dolphins. And uh, we have three vessels in the Mexico Sea of Cortez to protect the endangered vaquita, which is uh, facing extinction. And I'm quite confident that the vaquita mm -hmm. would not be extinct if it wasn't for our Operation Milagro in seven years of opposing uh, those poachers there. We've seized 150,000 meters of illegal gill nets in the mm -hmm. in there. And what we've uh, developed now is that we're now working in partnerships with numerous governments, African governments, Latin American mm -hmm. governments, partnerships with Peru, with Panama, uh, with Colombia, and with Mexico. And, what, and also in Africa with uh, Sierra Leone and Liberia and Tanzania and Namibia. And what that means is that um, we provide the volunteers and the resources and those governments provide the authority and the enforcement so that we can intervene in their territorial waters to stop illegal activities. Outside of territorial waters, we operate under the guidance of the United Nations World Charter for Nature, which allows for individual mm -hmm. young government organizations to intervene to uphold international conservation law. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, that's all my questions for now. So that's been an absolutely fascinating insight into you, to your work and the Sea Shepherd's work. It's been a, a privilege talking to you. And I know we've got an awful lot of people in the group who are dying to, to watch the interview. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for giving up your time. Um, you know, and all of us at North Northeast Animal Rights would like to say, you know, thank you and, uh, and wish you all continuing success because you are making a massive difference. Well, thank you very much.
Thank you. So this is Anna Amelia um, talking to Captain Paul Watson of Sea Shepherd, saying thank you very much for watching and goodbye for now. All right, thanks. <laughs>